Number 9. Raul Rodriguez On May the 1st of 2010, Texas man Kelly Danaher threw a party at his home in Huffman to celebrate the birthdays of both his wife and his young daughter. Raul Rodriguez, a family man himself, lived two doors down from Danaher and would regularly call the police complaining of his loud neighbors. Rodriguez was a former firefighter and Navy man who had a license to carry a concealed handgun. Yet according to witnesses, he'd often walk around with his firearm in plain sight. The Danaher daytime party extended into the night and included karaoke as well as loud music. After calling the police multiple times, Rodriguez decided to confront his neighbor and record the incident. The man was still on the phone with police dispatch and told them, I have to defend myself. Even though none of the men from the party had weapons, Rodriguez pulled out his handgun and aimed it at Kelly Danaher. As another man from the party approached him, he fired his weapon multiple times, killing Danaher. In court, Rodriguez tried citing Texas's stand your ground in his defense, but prosecutors argued it didn't apply since he'd started the argument. For the murder of Danaher, Rodriguez was sentenced to 40 years. Number 8. William Woodward In the neighborhood of Titusville, Florida, William Woodward and Gary Hembry lived on the same street. The children played together and the two men had been friends for several years. Everything changed in the summer of 2012 when the Woodwards accused Hembry's daughter of stealing a birthday present, which had been left on their porch for their own daughter. The relationship between the two families rapidly disintegrated into threats and taunts. They started calling the police on each other for various offenses. The conflict escalated after William Woodward, who testified in court he was a disabled army veteran with PTSD, was forced to get rid of his chickens. Hembry had reported Woodward for illegally raising the birds, which the veteran regarded as therapy animals. During the ongoing feud, neighbor Tim Blake, a former friend of both men, took Hembry's side. The conflict reached its peak on Labor Day 2012, when Hembry was having a barbecue at his home. In the months leading up to it, he, along with Roger Piccio, a man who was living with him, had reportedly taunted and insulted Woodward. The army veteran took a gun and went to Hembry's house. He fatally shot Piccio on the lawn in front of his son. He then went over to Tim Blake's house and shot him 11 times. As Hembry came out to check on the commotion, Woodward shot him in the chest. He fired two more bullets into Piccio's head after he returned. Hembry and Piccio died while Blake survived. Woodward was charged with first-degree murder and attempted murder. Number 7. Deborah Kinsey on October the 20th of 2015, Deborah Kinsey called 911 to report that she'd found her neighbor, Charlotte Nicholas, dead and covered in blood. Kinsey lamented the death of the woman whom she reportedly regarded as a friend. She even complained to the authorities of the violent incident, which she described as uncharacteristic of the neighborhood in Oakland Park, Florida. However, it was later revealed that the women, both in their early 60s, weren't as friendly as Kinsey would have had investigators believe. Nicholas was reportedly afraid of Kinsey, whom she described as mentally unstable, and had sent her multiple text messages in which she'd urged the woman to leave her alone. Moreover, Kinsey had gone to a pawn shop on the day of the killing, wearing blood-stained clothes, to sell several rings. They were later identified as belonging to Nicholas. The following day, Kinsey was quoted by an online newspaper as saying that she was sorry her friend had been stabbed, even though the details of the murder hadn't been released to anyone. Once tied to the killing, Kinsey admitted under interrogation she'd had an altercation with Nicholas, but claimed to have blacked out for most of it. Analysis of the victim's body revealed she'd been stabbed over 70 times with a knife as well as a screwdriver. Number 6. Abdul Bar I In December of 2010, a dispute over snow clearing ended in murder in the German town of Schnellenbach. The men involved only identified as 45-year-old Abdul Bar I and Wolfgang K, aged 49, had an argument over whose responsibility it was to shovel the snow on the sheared entrance to their properties. The fight escalated and Abdul Bar struck Wolfgang in the head with a snow shovel, killing him on the spot. It was later revealed that the two had been feuding for years, one major reason being that Wolfgang had built his home too close to Abdul Bar's, depriving him of his view. Number 5. Janal Jordan 
In 2017, a father of six was beaten to death by his deranged neighbor for no apparent reason in an apartment building from the Bronx borough of New York City. 46-year-old Bakary Darbo was in an elevator heading back down from his apartment on the ninth floor. When the doors opened on the seventh floor, he was dragged out and viciously attacked by his neighbor, Janal Jordan. The man struck Darbo with his fist and a cell phone before fleeing the scene. Prior to the attack, Jordan had reportedly been spotted shadow boxing in the hallway. Darbo succumbed to his injuries while Jordan was arrested a few blocks away after the police found him in blood-soaked clothes. Jordan had a long rap sheet going back to the 1990s, which included drug possession and reckless endangerment. It's believed that the two men didn't know each other and that the attack had been random. For his horrific crime, Jordan was given a sentence of 18 years to life in prison. Number 4. Zachary Latham In May of 2020, a New Jersey teenager fatally stabbed his 51-year-old neighbor in a confrontation that was allegedly motivated by aspiring TikTok fame. Zachary Latham, who'd recently turned 18, had been feuding with William Durham Sr. for roughly two years over the former's reckless driving on the residential road where they lived. Latham, a private in the New Jersey National Guard, who'd become legally emancipated at 17, had documented the feud on TikTok. In April, when Durham's wife tried to confront him over his driving, he filmed the encounter. Latham repeatedly called her Karen in a video that earned over 3 million views. The team would continue to post other videos boasting about his sports cars and about how he would handle his neighbors, captioned on a photo of him with a handgun. The Durham family was told by the police that they couldn't pursue legal action against him due to pandemic restrictions. The feud culminated with Latham swerving his car into Durham's 17-year-old son as he was riding his bike. Durham Sr., his wife, and their two sons went to confront Latham at his home. As the teen came out, he shot Durham Sr. with a stun gun, then fatally stabbed him. Latham's wife, Sarah, who filmed the entire incident, had threatened the family prior to the attack. Latham maintained that he was acting in self-defense and was charged with first-degree manslaughter. I won. Where's your emergency? There's blood all over the place. I just got assaulted and jumped. Right, are you the one that got stabbed? No, I'm, no, that was the other victim, but I got beat up really bad and I had blood all over me. All right, so you're at 2986 Thornhill as well? Yes. All right. And you want an ambulance? Um... Um, I don't know. All right, the person or the person, the people who did it to you, are they still there? They, they they came with trucks, came on my property with guns, and then when I uh, fought them off, they drove away. All right, how are you injured, sir? Um, my windpipe was cut in, and I got stomped out and choked by like ten people. All right, and where are you bleeding from? Um, I don't know. There's blood all over me. I don't even know if it's cut. There's blood all over our garage. The Durham family and their legal team wanted it changed to murder. They argued that the teen and his wife had lured them to the house in order to film the confrontation for TikTok fame. The case is ongoing and Latham was released pending a trial, but continued to post on TikTok. According to the latest updates, the teenager was legally ordered to stop talking about his own case on social media. Number 3. Rahul Surin in October of 2020, a dispute in Jamshedpur in the Indian state of Jharkhand ended in the death of a 30-year-old man. The victim, Rajender Sharma, tried to intervene in the drunken ball that was taking place at the home of his neighbor, 20-year-old Rahul Surin. Sharma tried to calm the young man down, but in doing so, became the target of his drunken rage. Surin grabbed a baseball bat and struck Sharma in the back of the head. The victim was left bleeding profusely and was later pronounced dead at a local hospital. Surin, who'd fled the scene, was arrested and subsequently imprisoned. Today's topic was requested by The Kid and Romela Kame. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Alexander Alexandrov In 2009, Bulgarian man Alexander Alexandrov stabbed his neighbor to death over a dispute regarding loud music. According to the Croatian Times, 27-year-old Martin Kromov had been listening to Angels by Robbie Williams on repeat for over a week 
after listening to the song being played at top volume thousands of times, 45-year-old Alexandrov flew into a fit of rage and fatally stabbed Kromov. He was captured by the police after he'd run out of gas while trying to dispose of his victim's body. Alexandrov told the court that he lived in constant terror over the music and think of nothing else but ways of making his neighbor turn it off. For the killing, Alexandrov was given a prison sentence of 16 years. Number 1. Melanie Smith Prior to a tragic moment in October of 2012, Melanie Smith and her neighbor, 20-year-old Lee Anna Shires, would often argue. The apparent root of the issue was the baby stroller that Shires would sometimes leave in the communal hallway of the building they shared in Prestatin, Wales. Smith would on occasion even threaten the young mother that she'd burn her home down. Smith was constantly angry over the faltering relationship with her partner. The hatred she harbored was fueled by jealousy and exacerbated by her drinking problem. These factors made her eventually view Shires as a target. On October the 12th, Smith was severely intoxicated when she saw the baby stroller in the hallway. The woman pulled out a lighter and set fire to it. The blaze rapidly expanded, trapping Shires and four other members of her family in an upstairs apartment. All five of them perished in the fire. Other neighbors had tried to help the family but couldn't get past the intense heat and smoke. Smith, who never took responsibility for the crime, was subsequently sentenced to 30 years in jail. Number 7. Susan Mice In February of 2018, a Texas teenager was accused of orchestrating the armed robbery of one of her friends. 17-year-old Susan Mice reportedly offered Preston Barry $150 in exchange for him giving two of her acquaintances a ride to Houston. Mize's proposition was a ruse designed to lure Barry into an armed carjacking and kidnapping perpetrated by two co-conspirators. On the night of the incident, Barry was ambushed in his car by a pair of teenage suspects that were secretly working alongside Mize, who pretended to be an unsuspecting victim throughout the attack. Barry was ordered into the back seat by a 15-year-old male wielding a firearm. The other suspect, a 16-year-old male, brandished a knife as Barry joined him in the back. He was then restrained with Mize's shoelaces, and the two robbers allegedly struck him several times, repeatedly threatening him with their weapons. The suspects then drove to an ATM where they forced Barry to withdraw an unspecified sum of money. After obtaining the cash, the teens drove Mize back to her home in Montgomery County and dropped her off. Once he was alone with the armed perpetrators, Barry revealed that he had more money at his parents' home. When the robbers took him there, however, Barry managed to escape their capture and subsequently locked them out of the house. The victim's family contacted local authorities, who tracked down the stolen vehicle at Dennis Johnson Park. A short while later, warrants were issued for the two male suspects' arrests, while Mize was brought in for questioning by the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office. During her interview with investigators, Mize ultimately confessed to planning the armed robbery herself and to recruiting the two teenage boys who carried it out. She was charged with felony aggravated robbery and was booked into the Montgomery County Jail. Number 6. Molly Elizabeth Peter and Larry DeAndre Ratliff Jr. A teenager was arrested and sentenced to 25 years in prison for her role in a drug deal gone wrong on April the 11th of 2017. 18-year-old Molly Elizabeth Peter, a resident of Des Moines, Iowa, allegedly served as the getaway driver during an armed robbery at a parking lot in Beaverdale. The young woman was an accomplice to Larry DeAndre Ratliff Jr., age 26. The latter was carrying out a pre-arranged narcotics transaction with Antonio Eugene Quinn and Michael Allen James Jr. when gunfire broke out. The drug deal had turned into a robbery during the course of which Ratliff shot Quinn in the chest and James in the arm. Des Moines police were notified of the shooting at about 9.20 p.m. and the wounded pair were transported to a nearby hospital. James was discharged the following day but Quinn ultimately succumbed to his injuries. Investigators swiftly identified Ratliff as the perpetrator of the fatal shooting and he was consequently charged with the murder and attempted murder of the two victims. He was sentenced to life in prison while his accomplice, Peter, also faced criminal charges in connection to the deadly incident. Her 25-year prison term was decided following convictions on charges of first-degree murder, attempted murder and first-degree robbery. Peter had held jobs at various fast food restaurants prior to her imprisonment, and her Facebook profile indicated that she was engaged to be married. Number 5. The Duct Tape Bandit 
In August of 2007, a liquor store in Kentucky was robbed by a man who'd wrapped silver duct tape around his head in an effort to conceal his identity. The suspect's crude disguise led to him being dubbed the duct tape bandit by several media outlets. The 24-year-old robber, whose real name was Casey Casey, carried out the high-profile heist at Shamrock Liquors in the city of Ashland. The store's manager reportedly spotted Casey attempting to steal $15 worth of rolled coins and proceeded to chase the masked man out into the parking lot. Casey was then tackled to the ground by another store employee who held him down until the arrival of law enforcement. Police officers were forced to meticulously peel each layer of duct tape off the suspect's face so as to identify him. In a television interview that subsequently went viral, Casey maintained his innocence and vehemently denied being the duct tape bandit. Nevertheless, he was ultimately charged with first-degree robbery and sent to prison for the crime. In April of 2015, Casey admitted guilt in an entirely unrelated case involving the mugging of an Ashland businessman in an alleyway. Casey committed this particular offense while out on parole and was arrested once more, resulting in a sentence of 12 years behind bars on a second robbery conviction. Number 4. Kendall Reynolds and Taiwana Antoinette Cody A 21-year-old woman was killed by rounds fired from her own gun while attempting to rob two men in central Georgia on October the 10th of 2021. Kendall Reynolds and Taiwana Antoinette Cody, aged 42, had met up with a pair of men during the evening hours of October the 9th. Later on in the night, as the four individuals rode together in a vehicle in Warner Robins, Reynolds allegedly brandished a firearm in an attempt to rob the male passengers. An altercation ensued in which one of the men reached for the gun in an effort to disarm Reynolds. During the struggle, the weapon was discharged and, in an ironic twist of fate, Reynolds herself was struck. Local authorities responded to a report of shots fired just before 1 a.m. Following the arrival of emergency personnel, Reynolds was transported to Houston Medical Center where she would ultimately pass away from her injuries. Warner Robins police later determined that Cody had acted as Reynolds' accomplice and she was charged with various offenses in connection to the armed robbery itself as well as the death of her criminal associate. Number 3. Robert C. Williams in February of 2014, a Maryland man was arrested following a failed robbery at a PNC bank in Laurel. Law enforcement officers pursued the perpetrator, later identified as Robert C. Williams, all the way to a Columbia neighborhood after he'd fled with approximately $20,000 in cash. The robbery was fraught with a number of crucial mistakes which gradually unfolded. At the onset of Williams' escape attempt, after entering the bank and implying he was armed, he demanded money from one of the tellers on duty before trying to make his way out of the building with bundles of stacked bills in his arms. The PNC surveillance cameras captured Williams dropping the stolen cash all over the floor of the bank. He then frantically attempted to shovel the money back into his pockets and even placed some of the scattered bills inside of an upturned umbrella positioned nearby. After collecting as much money as he could, Williams rushed to the green minivan he'd parked outside. As he drove away from the scene, the robber unwittingly passed directly over a set of spike strips that had been set up by Howard County Police. He led officers on a 15-mile chase with a vehicle hampered by a pair of flat tires. He was eventually forced to stop while traveling on Route 29, exit the disabled car and flee on foot. In what would be his final slip-up, Williams lost his balance on a patch of ice and was finally corralled by the officers in pursuit who found a backpack containing the stolen cash in his possession. Today's topic was requested by Brandon Camon, Phone Nem Keon, Felicia Jolly and Michael Ivey. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. The Cardiff ATM Robbery A 77-year-old pensioner successfully defended himself from an armed robber who'd accosted him as he was attempting to withdraw money from an ATM in Wales. The elderly victim was Trevor Weston, a retired Cardiff bus driver who'd made an early morning stop at a Sainsbury's supermarket on February the 17th of 2020 in order to take out cash to pay for the daily newspaper. After placing the money he'd withdrawn into his wallet, the grandfather of three was approached from behind by a masked man who was wearing a black baseball hat and a reflective safety jacket. 
The suspect, later identified as Michael Leonard Collins, aged 40, pinned Weston against a garbage bin and demanded the man's wallet. He allegedly threatened to stab the elderly victim if he failed to comply with his commands. Weston fought back against his assailant, landing a couple of punches near Collins' neck, prompting the would-be robber to flee the scene empty-handed. The footage pulled from the store surveillance cameras went viral after news of the incident had begun circulating internationally. The mugger eventually pleaded guilty to the charges levied against him in connection to the attempted robbery. Speaking after the incident, Weston recounted that he'd previously suffered a broken right shoulder in a fall at home, which forced him to use his left arm, the weaker of the two, as he struck his attacker. He also claimed to have never been in a fight prior to his run-in with Collins. Number 1. The Theodore Home Invasion A 62-year-old military veteran successfully fought off three would-be robbers during a violent home invasion in June of 2017. Michael Irvin of Theodore, Alabama had already been robbed a couple of weeks prior to the incident in question. The three suspects had stolen the former Marine's cancer medication and had also threatened to return to the man's home if he reported the theft to the police. Irvin was unfazed by their attempts to intimidate him and he promptly notified the authorities of the robbery. On the evening of June the 22nd, Irvin heard a knock at his front door. Upon opening it, he was immediately met with a shotgun blast from point-blank range. Irvin had, however, installed a plexiglass doorframe following his first encounter with the robbers. The thick frame managed to slow down the momentum of the buckshot, enough to save the homeowner's life and allow him to retreat to the kitchen. Irvin then grabbed hold of a handgun that he'd stashed in one of his cabinets and opened fire on the intruders, hitting each of them and inflicting non-fatal wounds. Two of the robbers managed to escape from the home and flee the scene in a vehicle after being found by Mobile County deputies at a Dollar General two miles away, they were taken into custody, as was the third accomplice who'd remained wounded at Irving's residence. The suspects named as Casey Ray Gann, Joseph Heathcock and Chase Dullaban all faced charges of first-degree robbery, first-degree burglary and second-degree assault. Number 7. Jacqueline Addis 31-year-old Jacqueline Addis of Phoenix, Arizona, was found guilty of stalking a man with whom she'd only gone on one date. The unidentified victim told the police that Addis had sent him a total of 159,000 messages over the course of less than a year, some of which were violent in nature. Addis found the man on the exclusive millionaire dating app, Luxie. He was a businessman who served as the CEO of a successful company in Paradise Valley. Addis, a beautician, had gone out with him once in the summer of 2017, after which he decided not to pursue a second date with her. The woman proceeded to stalk him for the next 10 months, inundating him with text messages and even showing up outside his house on one occasion in July of 2017. The man called the police following her appearance at his residence, but she didn't stop harassing him and even returned to his home a few months later. It wasn't until May of 2018 that Addis's extensive stalking was brought to its overdue conclusion. She was arrested by Paradise Valley Police after being found bathing in the man's tub. Law enforcement also discovered a large butcher knife in the passenger seat of her car. Addis would reportedly send the subject of her obsession more than 500 messages on some days and, in many of them, threatened to kill him, going so far as to call herself the new Hitler. The criminal charges against her were eventually dropped after she was found to be mentally incompetent and non-restorable. Her court-appointed attorney revealed her plans to move to Florida and seek treatment for her mental illness. She was permanently prohibited from making any form of contact with the man she was found guilty of stalking. Number 6. Jeremy Kelly A stalker killed his ex-girlfriend and then took his own life just nine days after a warrant had been issued for his arrest. Jeremy Kelly and Rosemary Riley, a pair of 21-year-olds from Ottawa County, Michigan, had shared a contentious relationship leading up to the event that ultimately resulted in both their deaths. After they'd already broken up, Riley, a student at Grand Valley State University, filed a restraining order against her ex-boyfriend, which did little to stop him from stalking and threatening her on multiple occasions. Riley notified local law enforcement that she'd been beaten and held at gunpoint by Kelly, also reporting that he'd then started following her around. Despite having knowledge of the assault and the ensuing stalking, the police didn't take Kelly into custody. 
On November the 6th of 2016, he arrived at the East Town residence belonging to one of Riley's friends, at which his ex-girlfriend was staying the night. He allegedly dragged Riley outside by her hair in the middle of the night. When she tried to get back inside the house, he fired multiple 9mm rounds at her, killing her instantly. He then turned the gun on himself. In the incident's aftermath, Riley's family took legal action against campus police and Ottawa County Sheriff's deputies, claiming they'd failed to properly protect the victim prior to her murder. The lawsuit also alleged that the warrant for Kelly's arrest hadn't been executed in a timely manner because his father was a police officer. The lawsuit was dismissed by a federal judge in September of 2020. Number 5. Erica Capps In the fall of 2017, a Florida woman was found guilty of stalking her ex-boyfriend and planting a tracking device on his car. Erica Capps of Samford had reportedly stalked the man with whom she shared a child for two months prior to her eventual arrest. The first incident occurred on September the 19th, when Capps showed up at the Altamonte Springs home belonging to one of the victim's friends. She sent him a text message demanding he come outside. When he obliged, Capps began to berate him for allegedly going to visit a female friend's house. The exact same situation was reported a month later at a friend's home in Maitland, and then again at a Best Buy in Sanford. On November the 8th, the victim saw Capps approaching him at a Walgreens, at which point he promptly left the store. As the man would later tell the police, he began receiving messages from Capps with pictures of locations he'd recently visited. He became increasingly suspicious as to how his ex-girlfriend so often knew of his exact whereabouts. It was then that the victim found a GPS tracking device on the underside of his vehicle and got in touch with local authorities. Capps was arrested and charged with stalking, but she was granted release upon the condition that she ceased all forms of contact with her ex-boyfriend. Number 4. Lue Nader Sacco A 23-year-old woman was stabbed to death inside her Melbourne home in 2020 by a former colleague who'd been stalking her for months. Celeste Mano had worked with Lue Nader Sacco, aged 35, at a call centre in South Morang before the latter was fired from his position in 2019. Mano, who'd been Sacco's team leader, tried to comfort him following his termination. According to police, the man subsequently stalked his former co-worker for nearly a year after his employment at the call centre had ended. He sent her more than 150 messages on social media, prompting Mano to take out an interim intervention order against him. Sacco was soon charged with breaching the order, but he was allowed to walk free. The man's obsession with Mano came to a bloody culmination on November the 14th of 2020. In the early morning hours, Sacco broke into the home that belonged to the victim and her family. Mano was asleep in her bed when Sacco fatally stabbed her. He was arrested and charged with the murder, but sought to circumvent jail time by having a medical professional declare him mentally unstable. Following an inconclusive assessment of his mental state, Sacco requested a second opinion in October of 2021. A pronouncement in that regard is pending, but his lawyer had previously stated that Sacco had no history of mental illness. Number 3. Charles Dean Bryant In 2016, a man with a known history of stalking women was found guilty of the brutal murder of Jacqueline Vandergriff, aged 24. Local authorities in Grapevine, Texas, first became aware of the situation at roughly 6.30 on the morning of September the 14th. Firefighters responded to reports of a forest fire in Acorn Woods Park. Vandergriff's dismembered corpse was discovered at the scene inside a plastic kiddie pool. The perpetrator had reportedly set her remains ablaze with an accelerant and subsequently fled the scene, although witnesses did tell police that they'd seen a man standing over the fire around the time it was started. It soon emerged that Van der Griff had met 30-year-old Charles Dean Bryant at the Fry Street Public House in Denton on the night before her death. Surveillance footage taken from a nearby Walmart revealed that Bryant had purchased the shovel earlier that day. Consequently, Grapevine police obtained a search warrant for the man's house, where they found the victim's purse inside his trash. There was also a kiddie pool in his backyard that looked exactly like the one found at the crime scene. Bryant's roommate told detectives that there had previously been two plastic pools in the backyard. Bryant was then arrested and charged with Vandergriff's murder. The incident took place a mere four days after he'd been released from jail, where he'd been detained on charges of stalking his ex-girlfriend. It was speculated that Bryant had targeted Vandergriff specifically because 
she bore a close resemblance to the woman he'd been stalking. The killer will spend the rest of his days behind bars, having been sentenced to life in prison plus 20 years. Today's topic was requested by PG Brother. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Stanley Zaliga In 2021, an exotic dancer from Fort Worth, Texas, was fatally shot while behind the wheel of a moving vehicle by a 54-year-old man who'd been stalking and blackmailing her. The murder of Abby Saldana, age 22, was carried out by Stanley Zaliga, a regular customer at Rick's Cabaret, the club where the victim worked. Surveillance cameras near the woman's apartment complex had captured Zaliga's pickup truck in the area at least five times within a 12-day span, indicating that he'd been stalking her in the weeks preceding the eventual shooting. Saldana also discovered a tracking device that had been planted underneath her car less than two weeks prior to her death. Zaliga had been visiting her at Rick's Cabaret on a regular basis and according to police reports, he'd threatened to publicly reveal the illicit escort services that she'd allegedly provided him. At about 9 p.m. on October the 26th of 2021, witnesses reported seeing a car speeding down the roadway near the entrance to the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. The vehicle then hurtled off the side of the exit ramp and crashed into the grassy area off the side of the road. The driver was identified as Saldana. She was pronounced dead at the scene after sustaining gunshot injuries to her back and arm. Investigators spoke with the owner of Rick's Cabaret and learned that Zaliga had been stalking Saldana for some time and that she'd feared for her life. A SWAT unit arrived at Zaliga's residence just before midnight on October the 27th. They entered the home to find the man on his balcony with multiple self-inflicted cuts to his arm. While being treated for his wounds, he was arrested and charged with Saldana's murder, having shot the woman from his own vehicle as he followed closely behind her. Number 1. Michael Lane Leading up to her murder on August the 25th of 2016, Shana Grice, aged 19, had pleaded with police to take action against her alleged stalker on several occasions. The victim had become romantically involved with 27-year-old Michael Lane in 2015, when the two worked together in Brighton, England. The man allegedly became obsessed with Grice, who eventually returned to her former boyfriend of hers after ending her relationship with Lane. Following the breakup, Lane reportedly told a friend she'll pay for what she's done. He subsequently placed a tracking device on Grice's vehicle and began stalking her. Members of Sussex law enforcement were first informed of the situation in February of 2016 after Grice complained about Lane sending her unwanted flowers and inflicting damage to her car. Over the course of the next six months, the police were notified of three additional incidents in which Lane had stalked or assaulted his ex-girlfriend. Officers found that Grice's claims didn't warrant further investigation and she was issued a penalty notice for wasting the police's time. A few weeks before her death, Grice noticed Lane loitering outside her residence but opted not to report him to the police for fear of receiving another fine. On August the 25th, Lane broke into Grice's home, slit her throat and set fire to her bedroom. The teenager's dead body was found by her boyfriend's father. Lane was arrested at his place of work later that same day. After a two-week trial, the stalker-turned-killer was sentenced to life in prison. Three Sussex police officers faced disciplinary action for their failure to properly investigate Grice's claims against Lane. The victim's parents publicly expressed their belief that their daughter would have still been alive had law enforcement officials adequately performed their duties. A documentary centering on Grice's tragic and arguably preventable demise was broadcast on British television in March of 2021. Number 8. Chloe Palmer On November 25th of 2017, a girls' night out in the town of Watford, England, descended into complete chaos when an argument broke out on the car ride home. The designated driver for the evening was Cristala Amphlett, aged 19. While travelling down the M1 motorway that connects London and Leeds, Amphlett got into a passionate exchange with one of her backseat passengers, a young woman named Maisie O'Flynn. Their dispute was about Amphlett asking for petrol money from the three girls she was driving home. At one point in the argument, Amphlett pulled the car over to the shoulder and switched off the ignition, 
in order to focus her full attention on Hoflin. According to the vehicle's GPS, the car was stationary for a total of 17 minutes as the discussion continued. Amphlet had the headlights turned off and neglected to activate the car's hazard signal while it sat motionless on the side of the road. Nearby roadway lights were not illuminated either, so the vehicle was nearly invisible to oncoming traffic. Others had to swerve out of the way of the parked vehicle due to the fact that Amphlet had the driver's door open and her legs sticking out towards the road as she addressed O'Flynn in the seat behind her. Suddenly, another vehicle crashed into the back of Amphlet's Renault Twingo. The brutal collision caused multiple severe injuries not only to Amphlet and O'Flynn, but also to Chloe Palmer, the 19-year-old girl sitting next to O'Flynn in the back seat. Palmer sustained major brain damage and ultimately passed away in the hospital roughly a week later. Although the case was brought to court to determine whether Amphlet should be held responsible for her friend's death, she was eventually acquitted in December of 2020. Following the ruling, Amphlet posted a video to Snapchat in which she could be seen celebrating with a bottle of champagne. Number 7. Jose Meza an argument between siblings in Calum, Mississippi, ultimately led to a deadly shooting on the night of April the 26th of 2021. Jose Meza was engaged in a fierce disagreement with his sister, 24-year-old Scott County resident Erica Meza. The triggering factor in their argument was a key. As the dispute reached its explosive conclusion, Erica took out a firearm and released a round into her brother's chest. Jose was rushed to Scott Regional Hospital and immediately tended to by medical professionals in the emergency room. Upon realizing the injured man had suffered a gunshot wound, doctors at the hospital contacted the Scott County Sheriff's Office. In spite of the hospital's best efforts, the victim was pronounced dead. Erica Meza was soon brought into police custody and charged with the first-degree murder of her own brother. She was held in county jail and denied bail by a judge while she awaited her trial. Number 6. Keeland Ahmad Pickens When the US's number one ranked college football team suffered an upset loss on October the 9th of 2021, events were set in motion that culminated in the death of 27-year-old Keeland Ahmad Pickens. The Alabama Crimson Tide were defeated by the Texas A&M Aggies, an outcome deemed unexpected by most college football fans. While attending a watch party in Bessemer, Alabama, Pickens soon became embroiled in an intense argument about which team was better with Emmanuel Tolbert III, age 20. The homeowner asked the two men to leave as tensions between them continued to escalate. Once outside, Tolbert resorted to violence to settle the dispute. Shots were fired, Pickens was struck, and Tolbert fled the scene. People rushed outside and found the victim with multiple gunshot wounds to his torso. He was transported to UAB Hospital but later passed away from his injuries. Tolbert was on the run for only a couple of days before he turned himself into Bessemer Police. In addition to Pickens' murder, Tolbert also faced charges from an incident in November of 2020 in which he and three others had robbed a man at gunpoint. Number 5. Alessandro Diaz Jr. 27-year-old Alessandro Diaz Jr. of Fresno County, California, met a violent end after getting into a contentious argument on his lunch break. Diaz was a forklift driver at Brevant Produce's plant in Reedley and on April 13th of 2021, made his way down to Oaks Mini Mart with a few of his co-workers. While browsing the convenience store, Diaz got into a verbal altercation with another patron named David Sedino, aged 26. Their dispute was reportedly gang-related as both individuals were later discovered to have ties to gangs in the area. Employees at the Minimart recounted to police that the two men yelled at each other for a short while before Sedino threw up his hands in disgust and left the store. Diaz and his co-workers subsequently made their way back to work. Unbeknownst to them, however, Sedino had started following the men back to the Brevant Produce packing plant. As Diaz got out of his car and walked across the parking lot, Sedino approached him in his own vehicle and shot him. The victim was taken to Adventist Health where he was pronounced dead. A warrant was issued for Sedino's arrest on May the 28th after Reedley police identified him on surveillance tapes taken from the Mini Mart and other surrounding businesses. The very next day, he was found and arrested by the Missouri State Highway Patrol. He was charged with murder and felon in possession of a firearm. Number 4. Calvin Durham II a heated argument over a Facebook post ultimately led to the fatal shooting of 37-year-old Calvin Durham II in a barber shop in Norfolk, Virginia. Durham's dispute with Fareed Nelson Luckett began around 12.30 p.m. on June the 4th of 2021. 
the pair got into an altercation in the parking lot outside of the Capital Cuts barbershop, eventually needing to be separated by a few of the shop's employees. Nelson Luckett was taken inside while Durham was left in the lot. That wasn't the end of the argument, however, as not long after their initial separation, Durham stormed back into the shop and confronted Nelson Luckett over one of his Facebook posts. The fight turned physical once again and Nelson Luckett got a hold of Durham's firearm in the midst of the struggle. Durham was shot with his own weapon and Nelson Luckett was wounded as well, but his injuries were not life-threatening. Durham, the son of a local pastor, would later pass away while receiving treatment at Centara Norfolk General Hospital while Nelson Luckett was charged with second-degree murder. Number 3. Tatiana and Adir In May of 2021, a Russian man simply identified as Adir was suffocated under the weight of his 225-pound wife named Tatiana. The couple had reportedly gotten into a drunken argument before the fatal incident occurred. Tatiana became so enraged at her husband that she pinned him beneath her backside and, quite literally, sat on him to death. She insisted to Russian police that she had no intention of killing him, but only sought to calm him down by physically restraining him. Their daughter, upset at the sight of her mother crushing the life out of her father, ran to the neighbors for help, but they deemed the situation a domestic dispute and left the couple to settle it on their own. Adir passed away while stuck between his wife and their mattress. His official cause of death was asphyxia from blocking the respiratory system. After her husband stopped showing signs of life, a panicked Tatiana tried to shake him, awake, to no avail. She was initially charged with murder, but that allegation was dropped in favor of criminal negligence, of which she was eventually convicted. She was forced to serve 18 months of corrective labor in order to pay £2,000 in moral damages. Today's topic was requested by Spaz Clown, The Professor, and Gordian alias me. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Alexandra R. Bloodgood A 29-year-old resident of Portland, Oregon, named Alexandra R. Bloodgood was shot dead by her own brother-in-law, following a heated argument that turned violent. The initial dispute took place between the victim's husband, Jordan Arp, and his 25-year-old brother, Shane Finnell, on May 16, 2021. Though the specifics of their disagreement were not revealed in the immediate aftermath, the brothers' fight was reportedly centered on the seemingly trivial subject of laundry. As the argument escalated, Arb threw a potted plant at his brother. Fennell then approached a seated Arb Bloodgood who was facing away from the two men. He pulled out a chrome-plated revolver and shot his sister-in-law in the back of the head, execution style. After hearing the gunshot go off, a next-door neighbor went downstairs to determine the source of the commotion and noticed Fennell on the porch across the street. He was flailing his arms and looked extremely distraught. The neighbor walked over to check on him, at which point Fennell confessed to the killing and asked the man to call the police. When the authorities arrived, Fennell repeated his chilling admission, saying, I did a horrible thing, as Portland officers took him into custody. He was charged with second-degree murder and unlawful use of a weapon. Number 1. James and Lisa Goy Tensions between neighboring residents of Plains Township, Pennsylvania reached a boiling point on the morning of February the 1st of 2021. According to others in the neighborhood, 47-year-old Jeffrey Spade had a long-standing feud with a couple that lived across the street from him. James and Lisa Goy, aged 50 and 48 respectively, reportedly had a habit of shoveling snow from their driveway and dumping it on Spade's property. Spade had requested they refrain from putting snow in his yard on multiple occasions before the situation ultimately turned fatal. Plains Township had just been blanketed with two feet of snow and the Goys moved the powder from their own parking spots over to Spade's yard across the street. The couple soon got into a shouting match with Spade as both parties hurled various expletive-laden insults at one another. The altercation became physical when James Goy threw a snow shoveling tool at his neighbor and charged towards him with a raised fist. Spade retreated to his house before emerging with a firearm in hand. Rather than flee, the Goys simply continued their verbal tirade from the middle of the street, reportedly daring their neighbor to shoot them. At that point, Spade opened fire on the couple, striking them both multiple times and inflicting deadly injuries. Police were called to the scene after reports of shots fired, but when they entered Spade's home, they found him dead from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. Number 10. The Long Beach Pirate California woman Shira Booker watched from inside her house as a porch pirate brazenly walked onto her front stoop and began rummaging through her mail, 
On April the 18th of 2019, the woman's home surveillance camera captured the moment of retribution that subsequently occurred when she confronted the thief face to face. A brief scuffle ensued as Booker snatched a parcel that the pirate had taken from her mailbox. She then warned the thief not to return to her house ever again and the pirate promptly scurried off the property and fled the scene. Booker initially remained on her front lawn and vigilantly watched to make sure the thief didn't attempt to steal any packages from her neighbor's houses. The homeowner later uploaded the footage of her triumphant stand against the pirate to her Facebook page with the caption, you may want to think twice about stealing from my house. Number 9. The Goose Creek Pirate In November of 2020, a resident of the Oaks subdivision in Goose Creek, South Carolina, posted a picture of a man wearing a green North Face shirt to a neighborhood Facebook group, claiming that he'd stolen packages from at least two porches in the area. The poster warned other residents to be wary of the possibility of more porch pirate theft attempts and also indicated that the authorities had been notified of the situation. The very next day, the man pictured in the Facebook post walked into a courtroom wearing the same green North Face shirt that he'd worn while committing the thefts. He was quickly identified by the police, who placed him under arrest. It wasn't immediately reported what charges the suspect faced, nor was his identity made public by the authorities. Number 8. The Portland Pirate After becoming the victim of a porch pirate theft at his home in South Portland, Oregon, Matt Coates devised a plan in December of 2019 to deter thieves from stealing his property again, as was detailed in an article written for the local news outlet KGW-TV. Coates created a bait package inside of which he put animal droppings that he'd retrieved from his dog, Marlow. Only three days after he'd placed the decoy parcel in front of his house, a porch pirate was captured by his doorbell security camera. In the footage, the thief was first shown taking a package from a neighbor's house and swiping a holiday light projector from their front lawn. He then made his way to Coates' porch and snatched the bait package before stealing a reported $120 worth of clothes from another neighbor. Although the surveillance camera didn't capture the thief opening the box Coates had filled with dog excrement, one of the latter's friends sent him a text message a short time later. It informed the homeowner that his decoy package had been discarded on the side of the road after it was opened. Coates' surveillance video went viral on social media, and Oregon City Police indicated that they were using the footage as part of their ongoing investigation into a number of porch pirate incidents in the area. Number 7. Tanya Moore Shortly before 12 p.m. on October the 9th of 2020, an employee of the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection was alerted by his home security system that someone was approaching his Shasta Lake residence. As was captured by the doorbell camera, a woman who was barefoot and carrying what appeared to be a pillowcase walked up to the house and proceeded to grab the Amazon packages that had been delivered to the front door. She then calmly returned to her car with the stolen items inside her pillowcase and left the scene. The firefighter would later tell investigators that he'd watched the theft take place while he was at work and that the swiped packages were worth roughly $200 in total. The Shasta County Sheriff's Office reportedly received dozens of tips about the possible identity of the female suspect. She was eventually identified as Sacramento resident Tanya Moore, aged 36. Upon being interviewed by investigators, Moore confessed to stealing the packages, which were reportedly still in her possession at the time of her arrest. Number 6. The St. Paul Pirate Hillary Smith, a resident of St. Paul, Minnesota, was notified that a package had been delivered to her house at around midday on December the 11th of 2019. When she got home from work in the afternoon, the package was nowhere to be found. There was, however, a piece of paper that had been folded up and left on the front step for Smith to find. As she discovered upon unfolding the slip, an individual had stolen the package from her porch. In the note, the thief glibly thanked her for leaving the parcel unattended and signed the taunting message as the new owner of your package. Smith subsequently notified the St. Paul Police Department, who posted an image of the note to their official Facebook page, calling the incident disturbing. They also offered several tips to members of the public who were concerned about being victimized by porch pirates. One of the security measures suggested by the authorities was that residents should require a signature for the delivery of any valuable items. Number 5. Carissa Shaw 
On August the 13th of 2017, a security camera from a house in South Tulsa, Oklahoma, captured a woman pull up in front of the property and casually walk up to the porch, where she then stole a package that had previously been delivered. The homeowner relayed the footage to local police, who reportedly stated that the video was of remarkably good quality considering it was taken from a doorbell surveillance camera. The Tulsa Police Department subsequently publicized the footage, enlisting the help of other nearby residents in their effort to identify the female suspect. Shortly after the video's release, the Tulsa Crime Stoppers began receiving numerous tips about the individual shown in the clip. And it wasn't long before the authorities identified Carissa Shaw as the thief. The 37-year-old denied having stolen anything and reportedly listed the package distribution center for Macy's in Owasso as her work address. Despite her claims of innocence, Shaw was ultimately arrested and charged with one count of larceny. It was reported that she'd been arrested multiple times during the previous four years in connection to drug possession and receiving stolen property. Number 4. The Huntersville Pirate On the morning of April the 22nd of 2021, a FedEx delivery truck stopped in front of a house in a suburban neighborhood in Huntersville, North Carolina. As was captured by the home security cameras, the delivery man retrieved the package from inside the truck and started making his way towards the front door. When a woman in a gray sedan pulled into the driveway and greeted him, she reportedly claimed to be the owner of the house where the package was supposed to be delivered, so the courier handed her the box, then returned to his truck and drove away. The woman appeared as if she was tended to something in the driver's seat of her car until the delivery man was gone, at which point she climbed back into the vehicle and left the scene. It would later emerge that the woman who'd taken the package didn't actually live at that address, but had followed the FedEx truck to the location of the delivery. The real homeowner alerted the police to the theft upon watching the interaction unfold on her security camera later that day. FedEx agreed to compensate the victim for the cost of the stolen item, which was reported as being a new laptop. As of the latest updates on the case, Huntersville police had launched an investigation into the identity of the brazen thief who was suspected to have victimized other residents as well. Number 3. Maurice Jerome Simmons South Carolina man Maurice Jerome Simmons was identified by the North Charleston Police Department as the perpetrator of a porch pirate theft on January the 12th of 2022. Officers of the department's intelligence policing unit were able to track down the suspect in his car, at which point they attempted to initiate a traffic stop. Simmons, however, sped away from the scene, prompting the police to give chase. Following a brief pursuit, Simmons reportedly crashed into another vehicle on the roadway, causing his car to flip over at an intersection near Charleston Heights. The officers then converged upon the overturned vehicle and took the suspect into custody. The packages that had been declared stolen were located in the trunk of Simmons's car and it was reported that they were subsequently returned to their owners. For his various infractions, Simmons was charged with four counts of larceny, failure to stop for blue lights and driving under suspension. Number 2. Tara Westford and Ronnie Bartholomew In an effort to crack down on port pirate thefts, the Sacramento Police Department enacted a package bait program that entailed placing decoy parcels implanted with tracking devices in front of people's houses. The sting operation yielded immediate results as, on the morning of January the 1st of 2017, the authorities were notified that a bait package had been swiped from a home in the 2300 block of Haldis Way. They tracked the package to a vehicle in the drive through line at a local McDonald's restaurant and arrested the car's two occupants. Named as West Sacramento residents Tara Westford and Ronnie Bartholomew, Officers searched a vehicle and found the bait package as well as narcotics, and the two thieves were consequently charged with petty theft, possession of stolen property, and drug possession. Number 1. Gabriel Poventu On December the 12th of 2019, Arizona man Jeremiah Lopez noticed a suspicious individual looking into his Phoenix residence from behind the wall that separated his backyard from a residential street on the other side. The concerned homeowner went out to confront the man who swiftly rode off down the road on his bicycle. As Lopez later told the authorities, the suspect came back moments later 
riding up to the front yard and spraying mace directly in the resident's face. The bicyclist then fled the scene for a second time and Lopez, with one hand covering his burning eye, got into his pickup truck to pursue his assailant. Lopez quickly caught up to the suspect and attempted to pass in front of him, but the bicyclist took a sharp turn and collided with the pickup's front bumper. The bike was crushed beneath the truck while its rider bounced off the hood and landed on the pavement. He then got up and started striking Lopez's truck with his bag repeatedly. The police arrived at the scene shortly thereafter and took the cyclist, named as 30-year-old Gabriel Poventude, into custody. In the wake of the arrest, a nearby resident recognized Poventu's face in the booking photo made public by the police. The suspect had been captured on a security camera stealing a package off of their doorstep the day before his run-in with Lopez, and he was consequently charged in connection to both incidents. Number 8. Erica Boudreau In June of 2020, a young woman was arrested for allegedly ramming into a man's truck and attempting to strike him with her car as he exited the vehicle. The road rage incident occurred right outside the Englewood Police Department in Colorado. The suspect was identified as Erica Boudreau, who'd left a tattoo parlor where she'd had a few drinks when a man in a pickup truck allegedly began following her and hurling insults at her. The conflict continued down the road until the driver of the truck pulled up to the parking spot outside the police station. As a neighbor later recounted to investigators, Boudreaux then plowed her SUV directly into the parked truck, pushing it through a landscaped area and into a security wall. The truck driver climbed out of his vehicle, at which point Boudreaux backed up before accelerating again in an attempt to strike him where he stood. The man ran into the station and Boudreaux's SUV rammed into a light pole. She subsequently attempted to flee the scene on foot but was caught by Englewood officers. The woman faced a plethora of charges that included attempted first-degree assault, criminal mischief, DUI, reckless driving, and driving with a suspended or revoked license. Number 7. Cornelia Moore A 27-year-old woman was shot and killed during a road rage incident in Austin, Texas on September the 4th of 2021. The victim, identified as Cornelia Moore, had contacted the authorities at around 12.30 p.m. She went on to report that someone in a silver Dodge Charger was following her and engaging in road rage type behavior on Interstate 35. Moore claimed that the individual had struck her vehicle and then pointed a gun in her direction. While still on the phone with emergency dispatches, Moore was shot by the driver of the Charger, but was able to provide her location before she became unresponsive. Members of the Austin Police Department located the woman's car on the southbound service road of I-35. She had sustained a single gunshot wound that was ultimately pronounced dead at the scene, in spite of the life-saving measures performed on her by first responders. Homicide investigators were able to identify two suspects believed to have been in the Dodge Charger at the time of the shooting. APD arrested 32-year-old Tony McCulloch and Rafini McCorkle, aged 30, both of whom were charged with Moore's murder. The victim was honored by friends and family with a balloon release at Zilka Park on September the 9th. Number 6. Kimberly Ong and Ryan Arakaki An incensed woman tailed a man who'd cut her off at a shopping center in Honolulu, Hawaii, and berated him while her young child was in the passenger seat of her car. The heated encounter between Kimberly Ong and Ryan Arakaki took place on September the 10th of 2014. The latter driver had cut in front of the woman at the Moana Lua shopping center near Pearl Harbor, with the maneuver nearly causing a rear-end collision. The man's careless driving elicited a furious response from Ong, who proceeded to follow him for an estimated five minutes. As she was tailing him, Ong shouted profanity-laden insults through her window and made obscene gestures towards the other motorist. Arakaki pulled out his cell phone and began to record the altercation. At one point in the conflict, Ong stepped in the middle of the road and exited her vehicle to confront the man. She stuck her head through his driver's side window and continued her expletive-filled rant, all while her young son waited in the car. After tensions died down and the two parties went their separate ways, 
Arakaki uploaded the video recording of the incident online, where it received hundreds of thousands of views. The man knowingly broke the law by using his cell phone while operating a moving vehicle, but he claimed that he wanted evidence of Ong's assault. Investigators deemed the woman's descent on Arakaki's car to have been unauthorized entry into a motor vehicle. Number 5. The Queen's Road Rage Robbery On May the 8th of 2021, an enraged driver assaulted and robbed two individuals during a traffic altercation in the New York City borough of Queens. The incident was recorded by nearby surveillance cameras, with the footage showing a white Nissan Sentra striking a grey Honda Accord at about 7pm. The 23-year-old driver of the Nissan got out of the car, as did his older male passenger. Giovanni Padin, aged 27, emerged from the Honda along with a female passenger and furiously demanded payment for the damage caused by the collision. Badin then attacked the two men, punching them in the face and knocking one of them to the ground. The suspect took the victim's cell phones as well as a wallet belonging to the older man, which reportedly contained an ID and bank cards. Padin and his female companion subsequently returned to his vehicle and sped away from the scene. NYPD investigators were able to positively identify Padin as the attacker and he was arrested on May the 12th. He was charged with multiple offenses in connection to the road rage event including second degree assault and second degree robbery. Number 4. Mia Renee Gamboa in September of 2021, a 24-year-old woman was taken into police custody after pointing a firearm at another driver during a road rage episode in Truckee, California. State Highway Patrol officers apprehended Mia Renee Gamboa of Merced just before 6 p.m. on September the 6th. While riding in a car on Interstate 80, Gamboa had reportedly become embroiled in a heated exchange with another motorist, whom she threatened with a handgun. At the time of the incident, the armed woman was sitting in the passenger seat of the vehicle while a man believed to be her boyfriend was driving. There were also three children in the car, none of whom belonged to Gamboa. Following the suspect's arrest, investigators searched the vehicle and allegedly found two guns, more than $10,000 in cash, and a bottle of Oxycontin pills that hadn't been prescribed by a doctor. The male driver was questioned by the police, but he was neither arrested nor charged with any crime. Gamboa was ultimately charged with brandishing a firearm, child endangerment, and possession of narcotics with the intent to distribute. Number 3. Richard Kamrowski and Mark Fitzgerald In January of 2019, two drivers were charged following a road rage incident on the Massachusetts Turnpike in which a man clung to the hood of an SUV as it drove for multiple miles. The confrontation unfolded after 37-year-old Mark Fitzgerald of Lynn swerved in front of Framingham resident Richard Kamrowski, aged 65, and bumped into his car. Fitzgerald attempted to take off following the collision, but Kamrowski stood in front of his vehicle in an effort to stop him. Nevertheless, the driver accelerated, prompting Kamrowski to jump onto the hood of the car to avoid getting run over. He reportedly implored Fitzgerald to stop driving, but he ignored the elderly man's pleas and continued driving down the highway for roughly three miles. Allegedly reaching speeds of up to 70 miles per hour, Kamrowski unsuccessfully tried to contact 911 with one hand while clinging to the windshield with the other. Fortunately, concerned bystanders boxed Fitzgerald's SUV in and forced him to stop moving which allowed Kamrowski to safely climb down from the hood of the vehicle. The motorist was forced out of his car by an armed passerby, who reportedly had a license to carry a firearm. Fitzgerald was charged with assault with a dangerous weapon, while Kamrowski was charged with disorderly conduct. Today's topic was requested by Blackman JRPG, Queen of Your Soul, Mifit Blue, 83PLG, and Jasmine Gonzalez. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Condelario Gonzalez A Florida man fatally shot a fellow motorist during a road rage incident that went horribly wrong in July of 2015. The victim, 44-year-old Condelario Gonzalez, contacted the police about a reckless driver on the roadway during the evening hours of July the 23rd. Gonzalez decided to follow the other vehicle in his own car, inside of which sat his wife, daughter, and grandson. 
The other driver, who was identified as 51-year-old Robert Doyle, called 911 as well and reported that Gonzalez was trying to run him off the road. Both vehicles eventually reached the former's residence in Beverly Hills and Gonzalez blocked the homeowner's vehicle in his driveway. At about 10 p.m., Gonzalez stepped out of his car. Doyle, who was armed with a handgun, approached the man and fatally shot him at least five times in front of his family. An eyewitness told the authorities that Gonzalez was in the process of backing up when the gun was fired, but Doyle's wife claimed the other driver was charging her husband. Doyle then held the rest of Gonzalez's family at gunpoint until the arrival of Citrus County Sheriff's deputies. The shooter was ultimately arrested and charged with second-degree murder, in addition to three counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Roughly a year after the incident had taken place, all the charges against Doyle were dropped. The decision followed a stand-your-ground hearing by a Citrus County judge who ruled that the man had acted in self-defense. Number 1. The Hollywood Stunts Assault On September the 29th of 2013, a 33-year-old man was viciously attacked by a gang of motorcyclists on the Henry Hudson Parkway in New York City. The violent altercation was preceded by a 911 call made by Alexian Lian, who told operators that he'd witnessed a group of bikers run a red light and nearly hit a woman carrying a baby. Lian's wife had reportedly tossed a half-eaten plum and a water bottle at the motorcycles, prompting one of them to punch the driver's side mirror of Lian's SUV. A short while later, a biker allegedly pulled out in front of Lian and decelerated sharply causing him to make light bumper contact with the motorcycle from behind. Within seconds, the scene devolved into chaos as other bikers charged Lien's vehicle, which was also carrying the couple's two-year-old daughter. The assailants proceeded to strike and kick the car, compelling Lien to accelerate in an attempt to escape. As he drove away from the scene, Lien ran over three motorcyclists, including a man named Edwin Mises who suffered a fractured spine and a punctured lung. The bikers retaliated by pursuing Lien for several miles. The man's wife contacted 911 a total of four times during the eight-minute chase. While Lien was stopped at a red light, one of the bikers got close to his car and shattered the driver's side window with his helmet. Lien was then dragged from the SUV and beaten relentlessly by several of the bikers from the group. They'd allegedly tried to pull the man's wife from the car as well but were unable to do so because she had her seatbelt on. Bystanders eventually stepped in and put an end to the assault, which left Lien with lacerations to his face and sides. A video of the entire incident was uploaded to Live Leak and subsequently received international attention. Some of the motorcyclists involved in the chase and attack were identified as off-duty police officers. Fifteen individuals were arrested in connection to the road rage event and 11 bikers were ultimately convicted. Number 7. Lawrence Eisenberg In March of 2018, the authorities recovered the body of Larry Eisenberg from Lake Coeur d'Alene in Idaho. About a month prior, the 68-year-old was reported to have fallen from a boat as he tried to fix its motor and drowned. At the time, he was on a fishing trip with his wife, Lorsine, also known as Laurie, who called in the purported accident. A series of revelations followed that ultimately pointed to the woman, who was also in her 60s, as her husband's killer, just days before the body was discovered. It emerged that she'd embezzled over $570,000 from the non-profit organization where she worked. Larry's autopsy then revealed diphenhydramine toxicity as the cause of death, and it was suspected that he'd been poisoned with a lethal dose of Benadryl. A known subject of contention between the couple had always been Laurie's tendency of giving too much money to her six daughters from previous relationships. Nevertheless, there were handwritten changes to Larry's will, which had modified it to leave 80% of his estate to Laurie's daughters and only 20% to his own children. In 2019, Laurie was sentenced to five years in prison after pleading guilty to multiple counts of wire fraud while still under investigation for killing her husband. In February of the following year, she was charged with murder. After the evidence solidified her ruthless scam, Laurie had killed Larry so that he wouldn't find out about the embezzlement and then divorce her, which could have seen her left with nothing from their joint estate worth over one and a half million dollars. She pleaded guilty to second-degree murder under an Alford plea, 
meaning she maintained her innocence but recognized she'd be found guilty if the case went to trial and was sentenced to life in prison. In court, Laurie admitted to lacing a drink with Benadryl, allegedly intending to take her own life, but that Larry had drunk it while she was sleeping on the boat. A judge would, however, tell her that the statement didn't stand up to the evidence. Number 6. O'Neill McGean and Brian Betts Two men who'd at one point been in a romantic relationship were lured through dating scams and suffered eerily similar fates, roughly six years apart. O'Neill McGean and Brian Betts had met in the 1990s and were together for over a decade, before splitting up with the former moving to Mexico and the latter residing in Maryland. In 2010, Betts, a middle school principal, talked to a man later identified as 19-year-old Alante Saunders through a phone chat line. They'd agreed to meet at Betts's home and he left the door to his residence unlocked. Saunders and two teenage accomplices then burst in and robbed the 42-year-old before fatally shooting him. The attackers were subsequently arrested on murder and robbery charges, with Saunders sentenced to 40 years in prison. McGean, who described Betts as the love of his life, vowed to be more cautious with dating in the wake of his demise. His weariness unfortunately waned in the years that followed. In October of 2016, he met a man through a dating app and agreed to meet in a hotel in Mazatlan, the Mexican town where he was living. McGean then disappeared along with $16,000 from his bank accounts. Jorge Guillen Gonzalez, the man's former lover and business partner with whom he'd opened a cafe, started receiving messages from kidnappers demanding $26,000. The message exchange, initiated from McGean's phone, continued for a few days but then abruptly stopped. McGean's body was then discovered in a yard buried under freshly poured concrete. At the hotel where he'd been lured, the attackers beat him so severely that they'd punctured both his lungs, killing him. His body was then wrapped in a hotel curtain, stuffed in a bag, and transported across town to be buried. Gonzalez, who was rumored to have been fired from the cafe by McGean and banned from his home, was suspected to have orchestrated the plot. He maintained his innocence but was arrested along with three other men. Number 5. Sarah Daisley In early October of 2021, disgraced former St. George bank worker Sarah Daisley was arrested in her native Australia once more in a massive fraud case. Daisley had been investigated for months leading up to her initial arrest in December of the previous year at a Sydney CBD venue. Footage, which made headlines across the country, showed her being taken in the back of a police van while wearing a skin-tight grey jumpsuit. The case against Daisley revealed her as the alleged mastermind behind a fraud operation from which she'd ultimately incur roughly 127 charges. She also reportedly had ties to the criminal underworld through her drug dealer husband, David Suka, who'd been convicted to over 20 years in prison in Western Australia. He was only 23 when he was arrested in 2004, after arriving at the port of Albany with an estimated 220 pounds of cocaine on a South American cargo ship. Since 2016, Daisley had stolen the identities of multiple people from driver's licenses and used her position at the bank to create fake accounts, through which she moved hundreds of thousands of dollars. She reportedly siphoned $350,000 from an elderly individual, basically stealing all of their life savings. In October of 2021, Daisley was again taken into custody, along with three other suspects, after the police had seized $400,000 cash, documents, and electronic items. Three weeks before her arrest, the 30-year-old had given birth to twins, cared for in her absence by Suka, who'd been paroled. In late October, the mother of four posted the 1.8 million bail and stated an intention of combating the charges against her, with a trial date potentially as far away as late 2023. The plethora of charges on which she stands accused includes 72 counts of possession of false documents to obtain financial advantage and 26 counts of possessing information to commit an indictable offense, among many others. Even if Daisley is convicted on half of the counts, it would still likely result in a custodial sentence. Number 4. Oro Jesse Amoka In the late 2000s, an Australian woman began an online relationship with a 28-year-old Nigerian man named Oro Jesse Amoka. In 2010, the pair met in Johannesburg and spent some time together without incident. Jet Jacobs, then in her mid-60s, 
vowed to return to South Africa and be with her lover again. Throughout their four-year-long relationship, which mainly unfolded over the internet, Jacobs had sent a mocha over $90,000. Family members warned the woman that she was being scammed and cautioned her against a second trip to Johannesburg that she'd been planning. Jacobs unfortunately couldn't be dissuaded. On February the 9th of 2013, two days after she'd met up with a mocha, the 67-year-old's lifeless body was found at her rented villa in Johannesburg. Jacobs' money, credit cards, jewelry, and laptop were missing, along with other personal items. Omoka, who in the meantime had returned to Nigeria, was arrested and charged with fraud. The University of Ibadan undergraduate was discovered to have had 32 fake online identities. While it was always suspected that Omoka had had a hand in Jacobs' death, he was never charged with murder due to the authorities' inability to prove it. Number 3. Shaniqua Jordan Shaniqua Jordan, the fashion blogger from Brooklyn, was arrested and extradited from New York on multiple charges stemming from scams involving identity theft. In March of 2017, a Stanford woman reported that several purchases had been made from her card without her permission and that accounts had been opened in her name without her knowledge. The fraudster had attempted purchases amounting to $54,000, which included two high-end Rolex watches, but only 3,300 went through mainly on a luxury shoulder bag from Yves Saint Laurent. It was delivered at the victim's home address, but because 30-year-old Jordan had also registered a UPS account in her name, she was able to intercept the package. As financial crimes officers looked into the case and closed in on the blogger as a suspect, they learned that she'd already been arrested for pulling another identity theft scam on a woman from Falls Township, Pennsylvania. Jordan had ordered an $18,000 Rolex from a California-based company who'd noticed some irregularities with the purchase and contacted local police. The authorities convinced them to send an empty box to the FedEx facility where delivery had been requested. Jordan was arrested at the facility when she showed up with a fraudulent driver's license in the victim's name. Today's topic was requested by Stax the Hustler, Spring Jungle the Second, and Rena Manvalova. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. A Ling Lu and Ji Hun Li Two California women were arrested on September the 19th of 2019 after running a scam that saw them earn close to $1 million in merchandise. A Ling Lu and Ji Hun Li, both aged 25, were apprehended at an apartment complex in Los Angeles on suspicions of theft by false pretenses and conspiracy. The investigation had been initiated following the events of September the 4th, when a man received a cold call from someone claiming to be an employee of the Internal Revenue Service. They said that the man would be arrested if he didn't pay them with $2,200 worth of Target gift cards. In such cases, scammers would typically have their marks read off the card's serial number. The victim obliged but then contacted the authorities. They worked together with Target Loss Prevention and looked over surveillance footage from multiple locations to see who would redeem the cards, ultimately identifying Lou and Lee as suspects. After the women were arrested, search warrants were executed at two locations linked to them, with officers finding hundreds of thousands of dollars in electronics and other items that the scammers had purchased with the gift cards. Number 1. Rachel Elwell in 2021, a woman from Brown Hills, England, gave a fraudster over $150,000, convinced that she was securing his release from Eastern European loan sharks. 50-year-old Rachel Elwell had met a man she described as attractive and intelligent through Facebook's dating app in early 2021, and they struck up an instant connection. The man claimed that he lived in nearby Coventry, and the pair agreed to meet in person once lockdown restrictions were lifted. However, the scammer then claimed he had to leave for Ukraine on an engineering contract. He later convinced Elwell that he was being forcibly held in a basement by criminals and made her believe that she was the only one who could save him. It was an elaborate scam involving multiple people seemingly confirming the man's identity. Elwell sent him about $10,000 from her own savings and then took out three massive loans. It appeared as if the matter had been resolved and Elwell expected him to arrive at Heathrow Airport. After she'd waited for over four hours, 
She was approached by Border Force officials, who told her she'd likely been scammed. Elwell then traveled to the Coventry address her prospective lover had given her and found that no one by that name lived there. She'd subsequently hoped that her banks would reimburse the money she'd taken out, under a code of conduct that protected victims of fraud. The woman was further heartbroken as the banks concluded she wasn't eligible for a refund. Thanks for watching. Would you rather attempt a bank robbery without wearing a disguise or have your parents invest all their money in a pyramid scheme? Let us know in the comments section below.